I think getting additional content is something we can all say is beneficial, but some are just built different. In this video, I'm going to rank all the major DLCs from the Borderlands franchise. Things like Headhunter Packs and Character DLCs will be excluded because I think those are a bit unfair to compare. So with that said, let's begin the ranking. But before that, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. You know, when you're traveling the world of Pandora, you've gotta constantly worry about evil mega corporations trying to steal your personal information. That's why it's important to use a VPN. Surfshark VPN can get rid of all of these problems for you with an easy to use one for all solution. Surfshark turns you into an anonymous and hard to trace online user and makes the internet a safer and more enjoyable place for you. With the click of a button, you can forget about data mining and intrusive advertisements. But say, are you out busy hunting vaults on other worlds but still want to watch your favorite shows and can't because they're blocked? Well, don't worry. Log in with Surfshark and you can get access to videos that normally aren't available to you. Now you can watch Squid Game and know what everyone around you is talking about. Surfshark is an all-in-one subscription which allows you to install and run it on an unlimited number of devices. Its 24-7 customer support ensures that your issues will be solved in a prompt, timely manner. And best of all, there is a 30-day money-back guarantee which gives users plenty of time to try out Surfshark risk-free. So what are you waiting for? Go down to the description below and click the link and enter promo code ERUPTION for 83% off and 3 extra months for free. Number 17, The Holodome Onslaught. Some might say it's potentially unfair to include the Holodome as a major DLC. However, I would argue that it still costs $10, the same price as pretty much all of the other DLCs with the exclusion of Borderlands 3, where the DLCs cost $15. This DLC comes in last due to the pure lack of anything it does. It's an arena-style DLC. If you've played Borderlands, you're familiar. The Slaughter Shaft, the Colosseums, just a relatively small area where hordes of enemies will attack you and you have to fight them off. In terms of story, you do hear Gage and Axton tell one, but the DLC isn't relevant to it whatsoever. You don't get to experience the locations, you just listen to a completely different and objectively more entertaining adventure than what we're currently playing. The only thing that makes this fun is that you're playing the pre-sequel and the Vault Hunters are fun to play as. As a DLC, this one comes in last. Number 16, Mad Moxie's Underdome Riot. For almost the exact same reasons as the Holodome Onslaught, Moxie's Underdome also isn't a very good DLC. It too is just an arena shooter and was almost put in last place because I consider the pre-sequel to have superior gunplay, thus making that arena shooter more fun. I remember when I was initially collecting all of the achievements in Borderlands 1, and three of them included completing each of the three arenas in this DLC. Not a hefty ask, theoretically speaking, but despite even having a modded gun that my friend gave me that could kill any enemy in one shot, it still takes about two hours just to complete one of them and it was boring as all boring could possibly be. Also, Moxie's Underdome, while it introduced Moxie and we love her, doesn't have a story. So why is it not in last place? Solely because it introduced the bank system where you could store your guns. The Holodome added a handful of guns and class mods, which are nice, but Moxie's Underdome gave us Moxie and the bank system, so just because of that, it goes above. Though not by much. I could also happily place this in last place. Those are the only two arena shooters that are on this list and comfortably fit at the bottom. Number 15, Sir Hammerlock's Big Game Hunt. You know what I've never heard anyone say ever? Hey, let's load up the Hammerlock DLC and play it for fun. This DLC isn't really one you just play. The maps are really large and not fun to traverse. The enemies are surprisingly beefy and difficult by comparison to anywhere else in the entire game. And the story, who really cares? Hammerlock isn't exactly an engaging character. He's fine to listen to and work with in short intervals or brief periods, but certainly wasn't capable of carrying a DLC, especially not one that wasn't going to develop him in any way. I like some of the unique weapons that were put in, but I would never load up this DLC to get them because of everything else. I would equate this DLC to the opposite of fun. Number 14, The Director's Cut. I really struggled whether or not I should include the designer and director's cut in this list. In a way, they are considered major DLCs for Borderlands 3, so I guess it's only fair. The director's cut's biggest draw is the small story it adds, which gives Ava more story. It progresses from where the main game left off and certainly makes her much less insufferable. 
but the DLC is really just a small series of side missions included with a raid boss. And I mean, that's nice and all. You also get tons of behind the scenes content, but that's not really worth any money. I hate to say it, it's neat, but should not be the draw to try and entice people to buy the add-on. It's kind of just artwork and clips that should be released anyway and not put behind a paywall. Number 13, Claptrap's New Robot Revolution. The unfortunate fate many of Borderlands 1's DLCs face is the fact that they were part of the first game and all subsequent entries increased what it meant to deliver a DLC. If any from the original, this one did progress the story of Borderlands and focuses on Claptrap's uprising, something that at the time you didn't really expect. Shooting Claptraps is fun and the story is entertaining enough, but that's kind of about it. I don't have a large impression of this DLC. I don't dislike it, but I think I just enjoyed all of the other ones more than this. Number 12, Mr. Torg's Campaign of Carnage. Now, I didn't dislike this DLC, and for some reason it doesn't feel good putting this as low as it is. Mr. Torg was very entertaining. Tina makes an appearance and coaches us, which is funny. I remember many of the bosses faced during the story, which is tough to say for other add-ons. But nothing quite jumps out at me about this DLC. The story is forgettable. The maps aren't exactly memorable. It's one that I can say that I enjoyed playing, but that's really it. Number 11, The Zombie Island of Dr. Ned. Welcome to Jacob's Cove, where the season is always spooky. I'm a pretty big fan of the Zombie Island DLC, as the whole thing is one big aesthetic. Tons of horror-themed elements and monsters you get to fight. Zombies, werewolves, Frankenstein monsters. It's really cool to get to see so many mishmashes in a DLC. Dr. Ned is also a really funny antagonist. Is he Dr. Zed with just a quirky mustache, or is he really his brother? I never suspected Dr. Ned to be evil, but who knows? Unfortunately, everything else is fairly lackluster. Because it wasn't intended to be a Halloween-themed DLC, the environment and landscape around is dead, barren, and swampy. Nothing that sticks out too much or makes you excited to revisit. Coming here to encounter and fight the unique monsters is fun for the novelty, but I never come here to experience Borderlands. I come here for the sights and to laugh at Dr. Ned. And that's the reason it's so low. It's fun, but doesn't quite exert the Borderlands gameplay. Number 10, The Designer's Cut. Okay, this one definitely does a lot more than The Director's Cut. It feels a bit unfair to include this DLC amongst the rest because I would say it falls more in line with a character release DLC, which I've excluded from these rankings. With it, you get four new skill trees, one for each Vault Hunter, as well as the Arms Race game mode. The game mode in and of itself was a pretty neat addition and much more fun than your traditional arena-style shooter. Each new run feels fresh and gives a ton of replayability. The story is pretty terrible, not that many would say that there even is a story. Axton and Salvador return, for no reason, and just commentate because they're familiar faces returning that the DLC can market and be profitable from. The skill trees were very cool to get, Arms Race was a great addition, though I don't feel great about comparing this DLC to the others, but technically, it is just like the others. Number 9, Moxie's Heist of the Handsome Jackpot. I feel very similar to this one as I do the Campaign of Carnage, with the exception that the map is really fun to play around. The casino aesthetic is really fitting for Hyperion and traversing the area doesn't feel like a hassle and is quite fun. I don't think the NPCs are very memorable in their own sense, and in terms of story, I mean, we like Timothy and Moxie, but Pretty Boy isn't much of a villain, and a story kind of needs a villain or something they're fighting against internally, which doesn't happen here. Otherwise, the story's going to feel flat. Remember Commandant Steel in Borderlands 1? So enjoying the story is pretty much saying, I enjoyed being in the presence of people that I like, not quite the story itself. This DLC practically birthed Zane players alive at the time by adding the Sea and Dead class mod, so I appreciated that back then. But I would still consider this the weakest of the Borderlands 3 DLCs, even though it does have some things that it does really well, like the map design. Number 8, Psycho Krieg and the Fantastic Fuster Cluck. Welcome to the inside of a psycho's mind. If you're invested and or interested in the story of Krieg, his backstory, or his emotions, this DLC delivers one of the best individual character-focused stories in the game. Unfortunately, outside of the story, everything else is pretty barren and lackluster. Side missions, that few which there are, can usually be completed in under a minute. The levels are fun to explore, a lot of which are meat themed, 
but what it sought out to deliver on, it did. The DLC was victim of being developed during quarantine, so I commend everyone who worked on it and got the product out. But this ranking isn't based on exceptions or understanding. It was a good story, with everything else being mediocre at best. I think the map design of the handsome jackpot is superior, but I value story more than that. The emotional beats were very emotional, the closure is really well done, but that can only carry it so far on this list. Number 7, Commander Lilith and the Fight for Sanctuary. This DLC was released seven years after the game's initial debut. It was really nice that the game continued to get content even after so long. It was meant to serve as a mini lead up to Borderlands 3. Not in the sense that we're getting any story relating to it, but it was meant to showcase Lilith stepping into her new role as a leader. The story was decent with Colonel Hector serving as the villain, and I thought it transitioned Lilith into the role she needed to be. Though it did do an exceptional job with its side cast, the B team was formed, we finally got united with the Tales from the Borderlands cast, and by that I mean only Vaughn, but it was neat. The effervescent rarity was also new, fancy to look at, and can do some unique things when paired right. Honestly, I don't have much to talk about with it other than saying it was an incredibly solid and well-rounded DLC. Number 6, Captain Scarlet and her Pirate's Booty. Okay, this one may be more of a personal bias, which is why it got so high, but I truly do love this DLC. The Vault Hunters are pretty much just like pirates anyway, searching for treasure, so combining the two together, I think works pretty well. Captain Scarlet is a very entertaining and memorable antagonist who tells you directly to your face that she's going to stab you in the back, and then stabs you in the back. It introduced Seraph weapons, even though I never used them and didn't think that they were worth it at all, but hey, at least it introduced a new rarity trying to spice things up. This is also where you get the Sandhawk, one of the best SMGs, especially that of the non-legendary variety, you could get in the entire game. It, for me, is probably in my top three favorite guns to use not the Borderlands 3 version. I thought the NPCs were memorable, the story was entertaining, and the guns were fun. I hated Master G, fuck him, but that's a personal grudge. Captain Scarlet's DLC was one of the best attempts Borderlands has put out with completely new characters carrying the story. Number 5, The Secret Armory of General Knox. I actually intended to put this DLC much further down than it actually was, but it kept getting pushed higher and higher the more I thought about it. I should probably justify why I even considered putting it so low in the first place, and it comes down solely to the traveling that needs to be done during it. There are no checkpoints, there is no fast travel, there is only T-Bone Junction and a car. Getting around this DLC is so annoyingly tedious I dread going back to it every single time because I don't want to drive from Scooter's Garage. It's such a buzzkill that honestly if it had a few travel checkpoints it would probably be somewhere in the top three. But yeah, that's the reason I even considered placing it low in the first place. The reason it's not is because it actually does a lot. It introduced Athena and General Knox, whose story is really entertaining and well done. General Knox was like catching lightning in a bottle. He's such an iconic character with his sarcastic and just tired of everything attitude. He's funny and you'll happily listen to him insult you all day long. I'd say he's probably the second best antagonist in the series, right behind Handsome Jack. It also gave us the armory looting, with Glitch, as most people did. And it also introduced the first traditional raid boss with Cromorax, who dropped pearlescent weapons, also introduced in this DLC. It's a shame that it's such a pain in the ass to traverse and all the wide open areas aren't very engaging. Outside of that, the DLC introduced many great characters and gameplay ideas which would go on to become staples. If only traveling didn't make me want to kill myself like General Knox, it would easily go into the top three. Number four, guns, love, and tentacles. Have you ever wanted to be assaulted by a bunch of tentacles? Not in the sexy anime-like way, but in the Lovecraftian horror-esque way? Well, that's kind of weird, but this DLC is the one for you. Similar to other spooky DLCs like the zombie island of Dr. Ned, this one heavily relies on the aesthetic. But unlike that one, this one excels in the environment and the world around you. You're always within eyeshot of Githian, the giant vault monster whose corpse lay for everyone to see. The townspeople are afflicted with curses in their pitch black eyeballs. Adding on to that, the NPCs are also really entertaining. Mancubus Bloodtooth is a perfect example to the ever-expanding cast that manages to stand out in his own way. The story is alright, which is why it doesn't get placed much higher than this. Yet again, Hammerlock indirectly holds back the DLC. Unlike his big game hunt, this one actually tries to tell a story where he has reason to be involved. Marriage is stressful. That's pretty much what this DLC boils down to. 
I do value story, but an okay story paired with a solid aesthetic, world mapping gameplay, nothing about it was actually a letdown. Number 3, Bounty of Blood. Ever since my other video where I ranked the Borderlands 3 DLCs, I've come to learn Bounty of Blood is the controversial DLC. It seems you either fall into one of two camps, you love it because of the Old West aesthetic and the fact that it took on a more serious tone, or you hate it for the exact same reasons. As it would turn out, I'm the former. I personally really enjoyed the more straightforward tale of revenge as a change of pace. I don't think Borderlands should permanently keep doing these because comedy is a staple of the franchise, but as a DLC, I think it is important to deliver something new. Most of us think gameplay and weapons as a method of doing this, but it turns out tone is also something to be considered. The Old West works really well as a setting. I felt subconsciously more inclined to keep using the Jacob's weapons because it fit well with the environment. The weapons you get from this DLC can also single-handedly carry any content in the game. And if you're a lore nut like me, you don't have to try and weed through all the comedy and nonsense to try and find out all the shady things companies were doing. It was straightforward, knew what it wanted to be, and pulled it off. Number 2, The Claptastic Voyage. Really the only major DLC the pre-sequel got, which is unfortunate, but on the upside, at least it was a really good DLC. I'm not gonna hide my bias, I definitely have a soft spot for DLCs that focus on giving a deeper insight into a character. It's much easier to be seen as having a better story than some one-time villain. So if you're interested in getting a literal look into the psyche of Claptrap, this DLC is very enjoyable. Things get kinda dark, which I really like. The story does what it seeks out to do on focusing on Claptrap and what he thinks and what he has gone through. It also introduced the glitch rarity, which was fun. I'll admit right now, I never quite mastered or fully got to understand or experience them much. I was largely married to my own builds and favorite weapons that outside of a handful of glitch weapons, I didn't play with them much. But from what I've watched and heard, they were a very fun new rarity. It has an amazing story, changed up the gunplay for additional fun, two of the biggest wins for a successful DLC. Number 1, Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon's Keep. Was it ever a consideration that this DLC wasn't going to be number one? Everything was kind of just perfect, and the most of what you could possibly want from additional content. The areas were all fresh and new, and felt like a whole new world and environment unlike anything else experienced from the franchise's past. The enemies don't come off as lazy reskins and are not annoying to fight, and most importantly, the story gives us a genuine and heartfelt insight into Tina herself, the way she has been handling grief and the defense mechanisms she uses to try and cope with it. The whole thing comes off as incredibly sincere and believable, while also managing to make the gameplay and story fun and hilarious along the way. Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon's Keep was a near-perfect DLC as you could hope for out of a game. If you're not into the story, the weapons and maps are still fun and worthwhile. If you're only into the story, the game doesn't drag you along. If you're into both, well then you're probably happy with this DLC. That is, unless you don't like Tina, which in that case, you're still wrong. The DLC is the best. So that's gonna do it for my list. What do you guys think of it? Do you agree? Would you have rearranged it? And for what reason? If so, let me know your order in the comments below, and until next time, I'll see you in the next video.